We're live. Hopefully we'll get a few people watching live and asking questions. Yeah, we don't have... We don't have awesome turn on these usually, but uh, we actually get a lot of people watching them after. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Just got to put this on our uh, social media. All right, seven o'clock. Hello, everyone who's joining us. Uh, welcome to our workshop four in the MRF series of live workshops. Uh, today's topic is how to start a rocket team. Uh, so you may recognize them from workshop one, uh, but this is our club's advisor, Chris Nielsen, here to talk about his experience of bringing uh, PSP up from uh, less than 20, I think, uh, members to over 300 now. 300 active members. Um, so for anyone tuning in who is trying to start a college rocket team of their own, I think this is a very valuable lesson. Now, I'll give this one to Chris so he can uh, start sharing his story. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to kind of go over some things I've learned and uh, some advice on how to, you know, it's, it, it's not really a one size fits all uh, path because it was multiple different competitions and projects and whatnot. But I'm going to try to focus more on uh, just kind of people aspect and the general teaming aspect of things uh, to help you guys get started. So uh, a little bit about me. I've been flying rockets for a long time. Uh, I, was, I started PSP, uh, or I joined PSP when it was SEDS uh, in 2015. Uh, and we grew it from about 15-ish active members to a little over 250. I currently am the advisor for PSP. I work at Zucro, doing a lot of different propulsion projects. I'm also a consultant on the side uh, with, with various other uh, rocket projects. So yeah, so starting a rocket team. So there's kind of a few different categories on, on competitions, right? Uh, most of you looking to start a team will do one of these competitions. I know there are some groups that go straight to a, you know, a large goal, like you know, maybe to space or to build this really large, you know, complicated, complex rocket. Um, but I would highly recommend starting out in a competition, no matter what it is. Uh, because the reality is if you can't complete one of these competitions, maybe with the exception from the special ones down at the bottom, um, you're not going to be able to complete 
a large, um, you know, a grand project that you may have an idea of. Uh, Orbit's a popular one. <laughs> Orbit and space are pretty popular uh, uh, student goals, uh, but a lot of those teams who have those goals of orbit or, or space um, don't actually, or haven't actually had a team in the past or launched rockets in the past. And they usually find out that uh, the lack of motivation is not, is, it's not the reason why people haven't gone that high before. Uh, it's uh, technically, technically and uh, cost prohibitive. Um, you know, USC is currently the only student team to uh, pass the Carmen line. Um, so yeah, yeah. But focusing back on the competitions, uh, you, the traditional competitions like Spaceport America Cup and NASA SL. Uh, I personally recommend NASA SL if you're brand new to rockets. Uh, they do a wonderful job of laying out the engineering process from start to finish, from the proposal to you know uh, the post-launch review. Um, so if you are brand new to rockets, you just want to get a team going. I would highly recommend an SSL. Now, uh, Space for America Cup is also a related competition. Um, it still goes through the same process. It's not as structured as NASA SSL, in my opinion, but it's still a great uh, competition. Actually, you have the regional ones like the Argonia Cup that's held in Kansas. Uh, Feds USA really isn't regional, but it, it is a smaller, uh, lower high power competition. Uh, and then you have the special competitions like Base 11 and Far Mars. I, I really, really don't recommend these things if you're a brand new team. Um, I know they sound really fun and exciting, but, um, you know, it, it really just isn't worth, worth your time right this second, right? Compete in a competition, get a rocket in the air, uh, and back down, and then uh, kind of look towards uh, the future. So the, 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 one of the hardest and the easiest things to do in your team is getting motivated to do something, right? So you likely had an idea, whether you saw a rocket comp competition, you, you, know, you got inspired somewhere, you know, the person starting the team is easily motivated, right? They, that, you don't need to sell them on anything, but getting others to want to work on the team is, can be extremely hard. So um, when, while you are uh, gathering your team and gathering the first few people and gathering a little more, you know, everybody is going to want to participate in Spencer's Rocket, right? Uh, everyone's gonna get all excited about it. But you'll find that uh, a bunch of people that are really motivated without a defined and clear purpose gets out of hand pretty quickly. Uh, and then it'll fizzle out as fast as it get momentum. So uh, define a purpose, right? We're gonna do this rocket or this competition or we're gonna launch a level three rocket or whatever uh, by this date, this year, whatever you want uh, and start immediately. So don't, um, don't leave it open-ended. Uh, teams that have really open-ended things like, oh, well, we're gonna pursue technology for this, this and that. They don't really go anywhere. They're always in a cycle of uh, design, uh, which is fine. If, you're a design, if you wanna be a purely design team, that is awesome, but, um, if you want to actually construct these things in the future, you need to have a clear, defined goal and purpose in mind. And that goal and purpose needs to be relatively recent. If your goal and purpose won't be completed in you know, 10, 15 years, this is not gonna work. You need to have a goal that's gonna be able to be accomplished within a year or two. Because when you get older, you move on and people change, that uh, purpose may move and you'll be caught in this continual loop of not really doing anything. So find to find that purpose and sort of immediately, even if let's say you're in, you know, January, the competitions won't have, uh, you know, entries again until September. Don't wait, do something now, build a small rocket, get to your level one, you know, read up, study, start. Don't think you need to wait to start your team until it's time to register for the competition. Uh, if you're motivated, you have a group of people that are motivated, go at it. You know, um, and kind of a sign up to this, uh, to what I'm gonna say a little later on. Uh, you may have a lot, a lot of people on your team, or you may have hundreds of people on your team, but there's gonna be a, a core group of five or six people. It happens every single team I've ever talked to. It's happened here. Um, but everyone's actually putting in the work all the time. So uh, 
you can't pick those people. Um, I'll get more into that in a, in a second. Yeah, so some keys to forming a team is your resources, right? Uh, physical resources, knowledge, uh, money, and people. So let's talk about people first. Like I said before, you need motivated people. Uh, I don't care if they're really, really smart people. You need people that are going to want to do the work, right? Um, right. If your first year, keep your team around 20 people. If you, uh, you know, it's okay to have a, a large call out and hundreds of people can come and be all excited and say, oh, we're going to put all these hours in. Reality, we found pretty consistently about 70% of those people from the very beginning drop out and usually left with around a, a group of 20 that are on the team or participating and that core group of five actually doing most of the work. Uh, hopefully one of them will be you. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, don't try to get too big too quickly. Uh, you definitely need to know how to uh, crawl before you can walk in. Uh, uh, PSP definitely experienced uh, growing pains uh, pretty harshly. You know, we went from a casual 15 person maximum a year to 250 uh, within, you know, within two years, uh, mostly within a year. That was a, we had a lot of growing pains. We did not know how to manage that many people, or manage the money with that many people, how to set up resources that many people. It, it really hurt. Now, luckily uh, and thankfully, I think we lucked out and we're okay now. But uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend doing that. I wouldn't want to go through that again. I would rather start or grow gradually um, than going instantly. Uh, have get one grad student or advanced upperclassman. Uh, you need to have somebody who is still a student who has an idea of what they're doing technically. Uh, actually, this happens to be a Silas there in the picture. You know, he was the our liquids team's advanced. You know, undergrad slash grad student. Uh, he was very motivated and he was able to give us, when you're in grad school, uh, you know, you get a little different perspective on things. And again, when you're, when you graduate from grad school is also another perspective you get on the project, but having at least one grad student who is really motivated uh, will be the, not only will they help guide you in your like learning journey on what you need to know or not, uh, they're going to provide uh, a ton of insight that is just, I mean, it's priceless. You, if you don't have one, that's okay. Uh, but I would at least try to get at least one. Uh, don't do applications. Uh, I have a lot of personal opinions on uh, student teams doing app, uh, applications. Uh, the reality is, you know, you don't, you're paying your school to learn things. Uh, so you don't really know what you're doing at this point <laughs> in life. Uh, I, and you're trying to properly interview somebody for a project which you don't fully understand the requirements for is kind of ridiculous. Uh, don't do motive applications. When I was a freshman, uh, the popular market team here at Purdue uh, denied my application, and so I went to and did something else. <laughs> right? Uh, they, you know, it's been five years since then, and they still haven't gotten a rocket off the ground. Uh, so, uh, and that happened with a couple other people that I knew. Uh, we all kind of migrated over to SEDS, right? We all got denied from their application because we weren't, you know, 4.0 students in aeronautical engineering and all this stuff. Uh, you know, don't do applications. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a, it is not necessary for uh, this type of uh, project in team setting. And even if you have an advanced complex project, right? You know, you'll be surprised. Um, you'll be surprised with people. Uh, because it makes it the reality is no matter how many people you quote unquote hire for your project after your application process, people are going to drop out. Uh, and personally, I would want, you know, if you're going to cast a net out, cast the biggest net you're going to get because you want the most chances of getting that one person who's going to put in, you know, their blood, sweat, and tears into the project. So do not do applications. Uh, and a regular team building is needed, right? I'm not saying do icebreakers, but, you know, as if I'm assuming that you are a, a team leader in, in this whole process, uh, you know, just do something with your team after after meetings. I know it's a little hard right now, but uh, when this passes, you know, like we used to go to uh, a small bar after every time you would work on the on the rock on, on the rocket or on the liquid rocket. So you know, we'd work until nine, we'd go to the bar, be there for a few hours, and go home. Right? Uh, 
we found that that three hours at the bar um, led to some really good conversation, not only in your personal life, right, but also engineering wise too, right? You're a little more relaxed. You're not, uh, you know, you're not stressed out. You're just hanging out, talking, talking shot to people. So definitely do some sort of team meeting activity. It's not necessarily a formal meeting. It could just be going to a bar, going to a restaurant, whatever you, whatever you choose. But it's, it's critical. Uh, get a advisor slash mentor. You need to find a reliable mentor who has some experience with their rockets or building things. Uh, having an academic advisor is fantastic. They'll help you a lot with the engineering side of the competition, but you really need somebody who turns wrenches or has done this type of stuff before in some shape, form, or fashion. There is a ton, you know, most of your problems won't occur on paper, right? I mean, of course, you're gonna, you're gonna do math and whatnot and you'll have issues you'll, you'll solve, but most of your problems that are gonna cost a lot of money and that are gonna be critical to your schedule are gonna be the physical tasks, the, the, the mechanical things, right? You need to have someone there who's been through these projects before. And let's say a rocket project, but they need to have been in some sort of project where they went from paper to a mechanical assembly that has actually done some things uh, that is critical. And once you get an advisor, listen to them, right? Your advisor is not getting paid. They're, the only thing they're getting from this is the gratification to seeing you succeed. So if your advisor is saying, hey, don't do that, the reason may not be clear right away, but there's likely a, a, a pretty good reason that, you know, it's hard when you're, when you do stuff for so long, it's hard to keep a detailed catalog of every little instant that you experienced and the lessons you learned. Sometimes you just remember the lessons you learned from that experience. Um, and so if your advisor's like, yo, don't do this with this type of tank. And you ask, and you try to, you know, you know, basically interview them on why and you give them all the fine little details and intricacies, you know, any advice they give you is not trying to attack you. They're not trying to take you out of business. They're just trying to A, keep you safe and, you know, B, how do you succeed? So listen to your advisors. Uh, approach the concept lightly to your advisors and also the school. Uh, I was talking to a school recently who was, was trying to start in the NAS SL competition and their school heard the word rocket and shut down the whole, the whole thing. Right, so schools panic very easily uh, when they hear that students are building rockets. Now, this activity is generally pretty safe. Um, and you know, with the appropriate advisors and mentors, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get, the li likelihood of you hurting yourself is pretty pretty low if you're following all the rules. Um, but I would approach your uh, advisors and or the school uh, very lightly, you know, Emphasize to them that this is a, you know, there's organized, structured things. That's why I recommend the NASA SL competition because, you know, oh, hey, you know, we're doing this thing with NASA is a lot better sounding than, hey, we're going to go out to, you know, BlackRock and do this crazy rocket. Um, that helps a little bit, uh, but definitely don't just say, oh, yeah, we're going to build a missile in the, in the, in the you know, machine shop. That's not usually going to go over very well. Oh, yeah. So, um, you probably wonder what the little card is. Uh, that's our advisor, Scott Meyer. Uh, we made uh, card games with the team. This goes back to the team building activity in the last slide. Uh, we actually made a card game with all the different team members and even the unnamed freshmen. Uh, we actually made the cards and printed them out. That was, that was pretty fun and a pretty, pretty cool team building activity. Um, yeah, structure is also pretty important. I recommend keeping your team structure as flat as possible. We have found, and even produced teams even, uh, the teams with the flatter management produce more. Uh, and usually because, you know, as students, you are learning, you're learning a lot, right? You're not only learning the, the theory side, you're not only learning the mechanical side, but you're also learning the, the team, you know, inter-team mechanics side. Um, and, Unless you've had some exceptional internship that you know with a company, a small company that knows how to run a, a team, um, trying to get a very structured with multiple layers of management or leaders or whatever you want to call them usually bloats everything. Uh, there was two cases here at Purdue with the teams uh, where they had uh, pretty large. Uh, 
uh, management structures, and just things just don't happen very fast. And in these teams where you guys have, you know, no timeline, no budget, you know, hardly any time to breathe, that extra time communicating with people, communicating with your with team members and leads, it's not worth it. The, the flab you can get it, the better. You know, have that one person who's responsible that, that you blame for everything, right? That That's super important. Have that one person that can be blamed. Um, but in collegiate scenarios, uh, you know, a team lead, that can be a, a more of a systems lead or a managing lead, and then a uh, chief engineer, you know, a technical lead, and then your sub team leads. That's it, right? Or maybe a business lead. Uh, that's also pretty important. Uh, uh, but that's all you need. You don't need a, a three VPs, a vice president, you know, a chain. You don't need all that, right? You need a technical lead, a managing lead, your sub team leads, and maybe a business lead on the side, right? That's all you need. Um, any more than that, and you'll you're probably uh, you're probably wasting a little bit of time. Now, I know there's some systems engineers out there that are yelling through the screen saying that's not right. Uh, that's just my personal uh, observation on, on on collegiate teams. Uh, it's, it's definitely definitely different once you get out of the industry, and there's a, you know more than you know a thousand people working for you. It's, you you definitely need a more more structure there. But for a twenty person twenty five person team. You need you don't need a, a hundred different managers for that. Um, and then one thing that I've also learned that I, I can't remember where this came from exactly, but the person who's most willing to do something is usually the less qualified. Um, and what that means is, you know, if you have or you're starting on a on a ambitious project and you don't really know what's going on, what's what it really entails, and it's kind of the feeling of everybody else, no one really knows what's going to happen. If there's that one person who's super, super, super eager to do it, and they just think they know how to get this thing done, they probably aren't the one you want. You probably want the person in the back of the room that's you know, excited for it, but also at the same time kind of nervous because you know they know what is coming towards them. Um, again, it's the same thing uh, with the liquid team. Uh, we had an individual who was extremely motivated to do it and he was an awesome student he, he was an awesome team member but uh he was inexperienced with this stuff and then we had another student who was you know in his senior year had a couple internships doing you know liquid engines uh he was really excited but he was like at the same time very nervous for the project because he kind of knew what was coming towards him um we picked that person and that worked out extremely well because uh you definitely want someone who is who's already kind of didn't face the music already. They at least heard it a little bit. Uh, they, you really want someone who um, is going to keep a level head and kind of knows what's going on uh, ahead of time. All right. So physical resources. This is going to be different for every single school, but you need to get space anywhere you possibly can. I know, especially in uh, colleges that are in the middle of cities. For large towns, getting space is a pain. Um, Purdue is, it's, we don't really have a set club space. I know Virginia Tech, I believe, they just built a whole building dedicated to different uh, different clubs. Uh, and I know some teams that have literally had their whole workshop in a, in a closet under a staircase with a couch and a TV. Um, it really, it really all depends. Um, but you need to start getting on that right away. And don't, don't think, oh, it's so small. I'm just gonna leave this for something else. Take any space you can in the beginning and then grow, right? Uh, you'll, you're likely to get space from your administration if you say you a need for it rather than, hey, we're gonna build this big rocket. We just need a bunch of space. You're not gonna get a bunch of space. Um, if you do, great. But the reality is you're not gonna do that. So get whatever space you can when you can right away. Um, if you're doing Spaceport America or NASA SL, Basic hand tool you know, is electronic equipment is really all you need. Um, many, many, many other teams uh, use tools that are a little more you know, or machines that are more complicated than that. Uh, but if you are really, really strapped with your budget, and time and space, you can make it work with you know a drill, some sandpaper, uh, a soldering iron. That's all you really need. Um, so don't feel like oh, if I have a full 
on machine shop. I can't do this. If you do have a machine shop, a friend them immediately. Uh, get in there, figure out what's the process of getting things in and out. We were very, very, very fortunate to have uh, at one point, I think a third of all the engineering or the machine shop TAs on the team. Uh, so we basically had always had a presence in the machine shop doing something. Uh, there was one point when we were building Vumi Zumi, uh, we had pretty much eight straight weeks of eight to five. There's always somebody on a machine just turning material and making something for the rocket. Uh, so if you have a machine shop, you know, get friends in there. If there's students running it, make friends with them, encourage them to be on the team. That's going to have a lot. Uh, and then money. Obviously, this is pretty cr crucial. Uh, I made a great mistake in the beginning of saying all oh, the money is going to come eventually. That doesn't happen. You need to get on money immediately. Um, you will never have money too soon. Okay. Every different, I, I wish I could give you a, a, a list of how to get money from your school. Every school is very different. I know some schools that, uh, you know, the school will give them, you know, 10 grand a year to work on their project. And I know some schools that will tax their student club to the point where they need to basically become a nonprofit organization that's loosely related to the school and have their own separate private bank account and whatnot. So uh, figure out what your school uh, does in terms of giving money to student teams. Talk to your development officer if you have one um, and do it immediately. Because I know for Purdue, for example, you know, uh, we have very centralized resources. And so if we want money from, uh, you know, the school's big sponsors, we have to apply for it basically in March to get it in August. So if you're in August and needing money for March, uh, that's going to be a problem. Uh, it doesn't mean it's impossible to not to compete, um, but you need to get creative on how to get your money. Uh, you know, I wish I'd talk more on sponsorships, but to be too perfectly honest with you, we have not been good at getting uh, sponsorships uh, directly. Uh, I don't know what it is. Um, we're, we're getting better at it, but uh, we've, we've worked out, you know, with the school getting the big, the school sponsor to you know, fund us that way. Uh, we haven't got many uh, side sponsors. Uh, in terms of money-wise, we have gotten sponsors for parts, which is a bullet point I probably should have added on here. Uh, if you're getting centering rings or body tubes from rocket vendors, you're not going to get them for free. You may get like a 10 or 15% off, off those parts, but you're, you're not going to get them for free. But if you're working on like a hybrid rocket, for example, and there's a valve you want, or there's some fittings you need, uh, you know, you can probably get those for free if you ask enough people. Um, so definitely ask for, for parts before you ask for money, but it is kind of hard to do with the, with the, uh, building materials of like standard rockets because the amateur rocket world is pretty uh, minuscule. And so they can't really afford to be giving, you know, 30 teams, 30 free rockets every year. So how much is this going to cost? Uh, this is basically from Purdue's perspective. Uh, and this is just different for every team. But NASA SL is usually about 12 grand. Now, don't look at that number and think, oh my gosh, I need 12 grand right now to build this rocket only need about two-ish grand to build the rocket, right? The rest of that money comes from travel, which is a massive part of all these budgets is travel. If you are, if you're not in, in Alabama or within driving distance of Huntsville or driving distance of, uh, you know, New Mexico, travel can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, that $12,000 includes, uh, I think, food, gas, and hotels from West Lafayette to Huntsville, which means nothing to most people listening to this right now, but the rocket itself will only cost about two grand. Your payload is also going to be a pretty big um, factor in how much it costs. Uh, but don't be shocked spending around 12 grand or 10 grand through the, the whole project. To get your rocket built immediately, uh, you probably need two to three grand. Uh, to start actually constructing these things if you're starting out. Spaceport America Cup, this is kind of a wild card uh, because of how many different uh, types of competitions there are uh, within Spaceport America Cup. So if you're doing the simple, you know, if you're doing the off the shelf solids at 10,000 feet, 
it could cost you, you know, a couple of grand, right? Not including travel. Uh, but if you're going to do a very complicated hybrid to 30,000 feet, you, can, you know, expect to spend up, up, upwards of 30, if not probably $50,000 to get all that up. Um, again, you don't need all that up front. A lot of that is travel, but you still need to take that into account because the worst thing you can do is build this rocket, spend all year on it, and then not be able to go to competition. And that's what's actually happened. So I'll talk about, well, you know, my freshman year when we did Space Port America Cup and we had no money and no, no support from any of the clubs. So I remember funding uh, all, the, all the rest of the savings I was gonna spend on school the next semester on the rocket. Uh, and so I had to take out a loan to pay for the rest of, the, of my school that, uh, next semester. And we built this rocket and we weren't able to go to competition because I wasn't able to get funding uh, to go out to New Mexico. Um, so I had, a, I, had a, I had my school's tuition look at me in the form of a rocket. Um, uh, so you definitely don't want to put that aside. You, you really do want to get that immediately. Uh, and a lot of restaurants have like those fundraising nights. They usually get you a couple hundred bucks depending where you're at. Very much Lafayette restaurants are pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, not really packed. But if you're in a, in a city, I'm sure that will give you a little more than a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and those add up. Those add up. So yeah, uh, a few mistakes. Uh, so freshman year, uh, we had, uh, like I said, a Space Force America Cup. Um, one mistake as a leader I made doing this thing, I kind of treated it like a class. You know, I was, there wasn't really any teams when I started here or any rocket teams when I started here. So I, and, and I'm bringing you to college. This is the first technical team I was on. And I was like, well, I'll just act like it was a class. And that didn't work out. It made the a team environment very stale. We didn't really communicate well as a team because it was a little too formal. Uh, we had no fundraising plan, which was a critical mistake, and uh, it was way too hobbyist, right? I, I, I was I was thinking I had built rockets for a few, you know a few years right before then. I just got my level three. I figured, oh, I can cheat the system here by just building a rocket to hit the altitude and be done with it, right? It turns out on these competition teams like Spaceport America Cup or NASA SL, a massive emphasis is placed on the payload. Right. And, and, the, and then the engineering process, especially in the, in the NASA competition, the engineering process you do to get to that. So if you just want to build a rocket and fly it to get the altitude and think that's going to be it, that is completely wrong. You are judged on the process and the engineering side of things, uh, not necessarily the rocket. I think uh, there was a few years where, you know, there has been events where rockets have either blown up or you know, crash landed. They still place, you know, within the top three because everything else was so good uh, that you know they added up all those points. Those points came for them. So, uh, you know, this is these competitions are engineering competitions. Uh, don't try to cheat the system by just building a rocket based off of what you know. Because yeah, the rocket was built, but the kind of the core purpose of the competition that really isn't advertised is the engineering and that process. Uh, sophomore year, our team was really, really small. We had six people total for the whole team. Uh, we had no engineering students on the team, which isn't bad, uh, but for engineering competition, you know, having someone who's at least familiar with how to write those engineering technical documents or, you know, from Nika or something like that, it helps. And especially when you're kind of still getting new to the engineering world in general, uh, you really do need, you know, a, a, a diverse group of students, not just all from one major. Um, yeah, and the same thing with the paperwork and engineering. And then junior year and beyond, uh, as you make account, right? Uh, there's always, there, there really isn't a, a solid, how to lead a college team book, right? It's just, it's just gonna be based off experience. Uh, but one thing I can say, out of all the technical issues we've ever had, so we, we have, so over the years, SED slash PSP has had about six different rocket teams. Um, and none of them fail technically. They fail with, uh, you know, the intra, team issues right now luckily we've only had out of the 
last four years of, of, of this club, we've only had, out of the six total, we've only had two that kind of fizzled out and not really gone anywhere. Uh, but all the major problems and the reasons why those teams collapse is inter-team issues. It's the, uh, it's the people issues. The technical issues can be solved, right? There's nothing, there's no competition out there right now that you listening cannot do, okay? You can do any, any, anything, right? But, uh, you know, communicating in that, you know, relationship with your team members is usually the one that, that gets people. So, um, so, yeah, so don't worry. So make sure you're keeping a very, uh, you know, open and lighthearted environment. If you, if you try to be too professional in this, in this setting, right, there's a ton of place for being professional in, you know, in your career and whatnot. But in, in this collegiate rocket setting, things laid back but serious and focused is a way to go. Um, some other key points. Like I said before, define a goal and a purpose immediately. And I don't deviate from that. Make it reasonable. All right. if, if you've never built a rocket before and your first goal is to go to space or go to orbit, you know, you're going to get a decent way. Uh, there is an Atkins law that says uh, a bad engineering with a great presentation is doomed to fail eventually. Uh, and well, anything goes on, it continues to uh, a good design with a bad presentation is doomed to fail immediately. But you know, focusing on that first half of that, if you get a good presentation, some good slides, uh, really pretty pictures, uh, and a, a confident you know person up there pitching this thing, you can probably get some money. You can probably get a lot of money, a lot of momentum, a lot of traction, a lot of interest, maybe some cool tools or some workspaces. But when it actually comes time to physically building and actually doing that thing, you're, it's going to feel pretty uh, pretty hard. And recruiters and staff and your faculty they understand the magnitude of some of these ambitious projects. And even though they may say, oh yeah, yeah, that's great. You want to go to orbit or you want to go to Mars? Awesome. You know, they still kind of, they still understand what that actually means. And so I understand the, uh, the, the, the romanticized vision of, oh, I want to go to space. I want to do this with all these rockets. I, went, I, I, I was there. I was definitely that one guy that was like, we're going to go to, we're going to, or we're going to go to the moon. No, I won't, maybe we'll make it to the moon before anyone goes to space. I was definitely that guy. Um, and I tell you that mostly for, uh, for sponsors and recruiting and outreach. You know, you have a goal, but have a, you know, a, a grand vision, but that realistic two year time frame goal is really, really the important thing. Yeah, start small, you know, don't try to, you know, Go to thirty. Don't don't go to Spaceport America with your hybrid going to thirty thousand feet your first try. Right? You want to you know, start with a level one rocket. Start with just up and down and work your way up from there. And find experienced people, or at least somebody that has has know what they're doing in some sort of mechanical aspect. Um, yeah. So that is the end of that. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. So I'm going to pass it over to Jack if he has any questions. Uh, I don't know if I have any real big questions, just more some some comments. I I can definitely, uh, being someone who joined the team kind of in the middle of this growth, uh, I can attest to pretty much everything that Chris said. Uh, first one being dropout rates. Um, that's a big part of any technical team and even like non-technical teams. Even working on MRF, you take on more people than you think you need because uh, people have responsibilities in college and easily get overwhelmed. Um, that's a big one, I think, for sure. Yeah, you have to keep in mind, these people, you aren't paying these people. They're, getting, they're not getting paid at all. They're all. The only benefit they're gaining from this if it's enjoyable to them. These are volunteers with other things to do that are, you know, they're paying for, right? So if you're treating your, your team members as employees and treating them badly, you're not, it's not gonna go very far. You know, you gotta be realistic. I mean, there, there. I know there's organizations that focus on you know professional development, and that's great. Um, but you need it. You know, my grandfather always said, "Take you know, if there's a problem, always go about 100 feet back and look at it from there. Right? You'll you'll see a different perspective, uh, and it really does work. So if you should, you know, you're all students, you're all in the same boat, you're all stressed out with every other thing going on in your life. Don't 
uh, don't try to make it too formal or complicated and then, you know, just bloat your team at all because of management and whatnot. Uh, be realistic with it. Yeah. And I don't think most people want to uh, give their free time to a team where you have layers upon layers of management you want to deal with if you're not getting paid for it. Right. Don't make it work. Make it fun. If, it's, if, you're, if, you're, if you're making go to work, you're going to quit. <laughs> I mean, it really isn't a, uh, there's no fun in that. I'm sure there's a few people out there that enjoy it, but most people uh, won't participate if it's like work. Yeah. Um, not to say that you can't have, you know, real work accomplished. I, oh yeah. You have to do it, but as long as it, it's, a uh, it's fun for people. I think it's, it's definitely right. manageable. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions either. Uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, this weekend. Just as a reminder for anyone who's seeing this uh, asynchronously this Saturday, uh, October, um, October 24th, our next podcast episode launches, it's propulsion. So uh, as you saw in this presentation, Scott Meyer, one of our other advisors for the club, uh, joins on a panel with uh, Purdue alumni, uh, Pal Pineda Busk and uh, Rocket Lab senior prop engineer, uh, Simon Muffat, to talk about their uh, experiences with rocket propulsion. And uh, as you also saw today, if you're paying attention, uh, our interview with Tori Bruno releases on October 31st. So a nice Halloween surprise.